All right. Well, morning or good evening, everybody. Welcome to this Icon S New Scholarship Showcase. Uh, this is a, a series featuring exciting new books in public law organized by the Icon S Committee on New Directions in Scholarship. Uh, I'm Rehan Abiratna. I'm one of the co chairs of this committee. Um, I'm also an associate professor of law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Very excited about the book and panel we're featuring today. The book is from Free to Fair Markets, Liberalism After COVID-19, which was published last year by Oxford University Press. The book is authored by Richard Holden and Rosalind Dixon. Um, Richard, unfortunately, couldn't be here today, but I'm obviously very pleased to have Roz here. Um, and we have three discussants. So let me, let me introduce each of them now. Um, maybe I'll also introduce Richard, even though he's not here, since he is one of the uh, authors. Uh, so Richard Holden is a professor of economics at UNSW Business School. Director of the Economics and Education Knowledge Hub at UNSW Business, co-director of the New Economic Policy Initiative, and president of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. Rosalind Dixon, I think, is well known. Uh, I'm pretty sure to everybody here, but um, I, I will give an introduction anyway. She is professor of law at UNSW Law and Justice. She is also a Manos Research Fellow and director of the Gilbert Tobin Center of Public Law. Deputy Director of the Herbert Smith Freehills Initiative on Law and Economics, and or co-director of the UNSW New Economic Equality Initiative, and academic co-lead of the Grand Challenge on Inequality at UNSW. Um, among the many past positions she's held, um, she was also the immediate past co-president of Icon S. Um, I should also mention that Roz has another book out, or I think maybe will shortly be out um, with Oxford University Press called uh, Responsive Judicial Review, which uh, I'm certainly looking forward to reading. Let me now introduce our discussants uh, in the order in which they will speak. So first we have uh, Boyan Bugarich, who is professor of law at the University of Sheffield School of Law. Though he's currently in Boston, I understand visiting at Boston University. He's the author of many publications, including the recent book, Power to the People, Constitutionalism in the Age of Populism, co-authored with Mark Tushnet and published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Next, we have Prerna Loop, who is Assistant Professor of Law at the National Law School of India University in Bangalore. Um, she has many publications, including, I think most notably here, a contribution to the Law and Society Policy Review Symposium on this book which is available online um, and I commend to you all. Um, and last but not least, another former co-president of Icon S, uh, Ron Herschel, who is professor of government and holds the Earl E. Sheffield Regents Chair in Law at the University of Texas at Austin. He's the author of several leading books in the field of comparative constitutionalism, including, I believe his most recent, uh, City State, Constitutionalism and the Mega City, which was published by OUP uh, in 2020. So welcome to you all. Um, just a quick rundown of the of the format. So um, I'll first invite Roz to introduce the book, um, followed by comments from each of our discussants, and then a response from the author, if, if she so wishes. Um, we'll then have a Q&A. At that time, uh, folks in the audience, you're welcome to either send in questions to me via the chat function, or um, just virtually raise your hand, and I'll invite you just to ask a question. This is a pretty small group, so please feel free to just ask the question. Um, and just to let everybody know, the session is recorded um, and will later be uploaded on the Icon S YouTube channel. So with that said, uh, Roz, could I invite you to begin, please, by introducing Thanks the book? So much. I'll, I'll, sh I'll share your slides. Yeah. Thanks so much, Rayhan. Not yet. I'll just take a minute to oh. um, say ah. some thanks. I, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm coming to the meeting from Bidjigulan and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging to thank my colleagues, Martin, Lizzie and Lucas for being here as well as colleagues around the world. I'm going to talk today about this book, Fair Market, From Free to Fair Markets, as well as its implications for constitutionalism. But I want to note that Pren has already written a really interesting and important engagement with this, which I really commend to you and Pren, you should put it in the chat. But particularly to Ran and Bojan, as comparative constitutional scholars, they've both in their own way called attention to material dimensions of the challenge of liberal constitutionalism, which I believe are really critical. Um, Bojan's work on this dates for several years. And I think that Ran's book, Megacities, is the beginning of a broader agenda 
to try and reorient the field more closely to some of the greatest challenges we face. I remember sitting at the conference in Santiago in 2019, I believe, um, and talking a lot about populism at that time and feeling that there was a huge disconnect between what we were saying in the room and what I feel are some of the major drivers of people's turn to, you know, illiberal anti-constitutional populism. I think, Bojan, you've written about this in a very powerful way. I think economic marginalisation and dissatisfaction with what neoliberal economic policies and global orders have produced is a major factor driving what we observe constitutionally. And unless and until we grapple as public lawyers with these underlying dynamics, we're missing actually a big part of the challenge. I think it's interesting, you know, it's a bad time of day, but it is also reflective of our aversion as public lawyers to thinking about economics that we have a small group. And I think it's really actually very problematic because economists are mostly trained to be positive thinkers, not normative thinkers, to take a kind of set of blueprints and implement them rather than to drive um, change in a political and constitutional theoretic direction. So public lawyers and public policy thinkers and political theorists are really well positioned to create a vision of uh, democratic constitutionalism that takes economic inequality and marginalization and poverty seriously. And yet if we are averse to engaging with kind of technical difficult economic arguments, we don't have a seat at the table and we have no chance of influence. And so I see this book as the first of an intervention that I think will last for decades for those of us who believe that unless economics and public policy and public law speak to each other, as public lawyers will be coming in, you know, to fight fires once the, the building has been built all wrong. And we have to be more able to engage at the outset in imagining the kind of democratic policies that are infused with democratic public law values that will actually meet people's needs and aspirations and shore up their commitment to constitutional democracy. So that's the spirit in which this book is a deeply public law book. Um, even though if you read it, you'll think that it's a largely public policy book and definitely one can read it that way. Um, and, you know, people like Prenner have done a great job of contributing it at, at that level. And it's really important to see it in those terms as well. So if I can turn to the first of the substantive slides, please, uh, Rehan. Let me briefly outline what the book says and then what I think its major implications are for constitutionalism. So the book Joint with Richard basically starts with the idea that we should not walk away from liberalism or abandon it as an inherently flawed neoliberal project. That liberalism comes in many variants from classical to neoliberalism, but it also has had social egalitarian democratic variants in the 20s, uh, earlier on, you know, you can look at Hobhouse and Green and other thinkers, and then you can see strands in thinking throughout the 20th century that support a more social democratic egalitarian vision. <clears throat> democratic liberalism or this more egalitarian vision has advantages even over, uh, you know, democratic socialist alternatives, let alone economic nationalist or communitarian alternatives in terms of its capacity to promote and respect individual freedom, to generate economic growth and wealth, and to lift people out of poverty. One of the things that's problematic about the critique of free trade and some of the benefits of liberalisation that has been more or less flawed has that it has lifted millions and millions of people out of extreme poverty. And the growth and anti-poverty dimension of markets can only be ignored at our peril. So what does the book say a more democratically liberal model would mean economically? It means a commitment to markets, not to businesses and their profits, but to markets, including global markets and the idea of free trade of goods and persons across our state lines, subject to reasonable restrictions, of course, but subject to an understanding that the state has a critical role to play in countering four sources of market failure. And this is, of course, what clearly distinguishes 
fair market ideas, which are synonymous with democratic liberalism in our book, uh, from any kind of more neoliberal variant which wants to see the state exit from economic regulation to prioritise a small state, deregulation, privatisation, austerity over a robust role for the state. So the first is to counter market power in the form of oligopolistic or monopolistic practices and the role of big organisations, you know, big corporations in exerting power to uh, drive down wages, to fail to protect the environment, to price in ways that promote business profits over worker and consumer welfare. The second is encountering what econo economists call externalities. These are the social costs and benefits, but relevantly social costs, mostly, of transactions not borne by the parties to the transaction. Pollution uh, being the absolute canonical example, but there are others. So the market needs to respond, uh, but the state has a critically important role to play in forcing the market to respond and internalise these externalities in a fair market approach. The third is the failure of markets to produce a universal dignified social minimum. And the social egalitarian dimension of fair markets is the idea that you start with a commitment to freedom, dignity and equality, and it's completely politically and morally unacceptable for some citizens to fall below that dignified social minimum simply because of market forces, uh, poor, poor luck, poor choices, or outcomes beyond their control. And that the state has a role to ensure universal access to that minimum level, um, and the, a minimum that is socially and contextually derived as well as derived from understandings based in the capabilities approach. But we also suggest that there are some goods that are not only core goods but have a relative dimension and that those goods are ones which markets should not only produce an adequate level of but in Moyne's terms uh, to go beyond sufficiency or adequacy to actual equality and they are education, proximate housing and life-preserving medical care. So it's all right in our account for people to have different wallpaper in their hospital rooms or friendlier receptionists based on access to private cover, but not a different probability of survival based on market um, outcomes. And similarly, it's okay for them to have a fancier house uh, across the road from someone else's perfectly adequate house, that's the, the, the core good, but the relativity consists in proximity to other core goods, so schooling, jobs, other amenities, and that you have to have an equal right, not just a minimum right, an equal right, to live proximate to those other aspects of a life of full human dignity. The term fair markets is deliberately a riff off the idea of fair trade, but it, it is more pro-market than many fair trade ideas, and it simply takes a common sense understanding of fairness to try and capture these four key principles of when states have a responsibility and indeed a duty to intervene to correct market failure either, we argue, by directly providing a good or by subsidising access to it for those who would otherwise be unable to pay or by regulating, taxing or indeed even prohibiting certain forms of conduct in appropriate circumstances. Next slide, please, uh, Rehan. So one of the questions is what would this mean for fair markets in a constitutional context? One, of course, is the political dimension that this is the why we call it democratic liberalism, which is externalities and the social minimum aren't, you know, self-defining contextually. They require democratic input for us to determine what counts for that purpose. But there's also a close empirical relationship between fair political and economic markets in terms of fair political markets being designed to be responsive to the median voter in ways that are likely to lead to uh, economic fair market policies, although that's a more contingent and complicated um, interaction which we might want to discuss after the comments and in Q&A. So a democratic constitutional vision would look like um, something that I outline in the article in the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies that I've posted at the top of this slide. It would look like a constitution with some form of property rights protection that is neither too strong nor too weak, so very Goldilocks-like, but really a form of weak protection that is more than minimal in order to distinguish it from a more purely democratic socialist conception of the relationship between state 
and economy. But conversely, in distinction to neoliberalism, it would enshrine a range of social and economic rights protection, albeit as a form of weak dialogic flaw, because there is no necessary requirement for a commitment to social rights to be provided through justiciable uh, social rights. It is likely to promote their realisation, but in ways that are more contingent. And as we've learned from the work of people like Miller Versteeg and Adam Chilton, in ways we need to be more careful about in claiming a one-to-one -one correlation between outcome and constitutionalisation. So I say a weak dialogic flaw as a desirable but not necessary dimension of constitutionalism, a commitment to horizontal effects <clears throat> or a degree to which the constitution regulates private as well as public power, but with some kind of notion of subsidiarity or indirect horizontal application because of a desire to allow scope for legislatures to have a role in defining how we provide the minimum core, how we regulate markets when it comes to externalities and market power, because there is more than one method consistent with democratic liberalism. And finally, an understanding of equality provisions that does allow for a very economically focused conception of equality, unlike most constitutions worldwide, but one that is not a flat or across the board guarantee of equality of outcomes, but rather quite selective in understanding the difference between what I would call absolute and relative goods in terms of the guarantee of equality as opposed to adequacy of access. There's obviously a lot of complexity in a book that length and an article that uh, follows on from it, but I promised that I would stop there and allow time for our commentators and for a discussion. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Raz. Um, can I turn to uh, Boyan, please, uh, for your comments? Well, thank you. First, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to comment on this very important and very timely book. I will uh, uh, organize my comments in three separate parts. First, the conceptual part. Second, the practical policy part. And the last is the constitutional part, which is uh, based on the uh, Ross's uh, oh, Journal of Legal Studies article that fleshes out the constitutional implications of the arguments uh, made in the book. So in the first, the conceptual part, uh, first I want to mention the three important reasons why I want to uh, congratulate the authors and why I see uh, 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 important steps being made in the book in terms already described actually by Ross initially. So the first thing is the books, unlike many others actually in the field today, takes the failures of the neoliberal version of liberalism very seriously and tries to respond to it by rethinking liberalism and by making liberalism more democratic. Uh, why is this important? Um, so uh, to avoid duplication, I think Ross already mentioned that, you know, her feeling sitting in one of the conferences, I had exactly the same feeling you know, that there was often, you know, shifting blame to all sorts of other reasons Whereas this book is really one of the few that offers a critical introspection into the world of liberalism and tries to enlarge you know, the perspectives, the, 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 the possibilities that different versions of liberalism can offer in order to uh, uh, respond to the critiques, which are you know, uh, many. So that, that's the first, the first point I want to mention. The second uh, very, very important point has to do with the fact that book, the book puts the political economy at the forefront of its analysis. Another very, very important thing which distinguishes book from many others in the field. Um, you know, it's very dangerous to overgeneralize, but my reading of most of the books is they try to um, deflate the importance of political economy and inflate the importance of various other factors, like the leading, Example would be Pippa Norris and Inglehart arguing that it's mostly the cultural factors going back for decades, you know, and now changing the attitudes of people in different directions that are causing this all this uh, malaise, you know, in terms of you know economic inequality, the rise of autocrats, bad guys, populists, and so on and so on. Uh, this book takes a different perspective, puts the political economy in the front, and by taking this perspective, also accepts the 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 the, the fault of the liberalism for many of the uh, bad results that uh, are uh, being uh, produced by many center 
uh, an all right uh, liberal uh, uh, governments that have been in power in the last two, three decades. Um, uh, next, uh, moving a little bit more to more theoretical conceptual part, uh, the book builds on the older tradition of democratic liberalism, exemplified as Rose already mentioned, not only by Hobhouse and Green, but also many social liberals among the progressives and New Dealers in the US. And the arguments here uh, in the book contributes to a very important strand of literature arguing that there are many possible forms that market economies and re representative democracies can assume. And also the argument contributes to the critique of the so-called closed list theory of social orders, uh, where you basically uh, end up arguing that what you see, the constitutional arrangement that you see around the world exhausts the possibility of uh, one or another form of market economy that, uh, can, that can exist. There are many different names for these theories, ranging from varieties of capitalism, democratic experimentalism, empowered democracy, super liberalism, and I think these books is another important contribution to this very, very timely and important uh, literature and debate. Uh, then uh, next point, the book also in construing three ideal types, which are the neoliberal ideal type, the democratic liberal ideal type and democratic socialist ideal type emphasizes that there are important continuities, for example, between democratic liberalism and so-called market-based forms of democratic socialism. In other forms, their model of democratic liberalism does not exhaust the possible list of alternative forms of even more democratic forms of liberalism. That's fine also as a, a very powerful and important argument, which will probably be here in the place for a couple of uh, next years when we're going to discuss these problems. The authors don't argue that the proposals that they put forward exhaust the possible list of returns. They deliberately uh, put the proposals on this sort of, uh, again, on this uh, 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 list, continuous list of other possibilities that are not exhausted, but, but, but their own proposals. Uh, think here, for example, about the New Deal. Although accused at the time by conservatives of being anti-American and socialist, it was basically a radical form of democratic liberalism. As you know, FDR put in one of his famous fireside chats, you know, it was basically an attempt to save capitalism from itself. And yet today, when we look back at the structural institutional reforms of, uh, of FDR and New Deal, we tend to put it in a very different category from the type of reforms that Ross and uh, Richard are talking about. But again, that only illustrates you know, how many different forms can you know, this more responsive progressive liberalism uh, assume and, uh, and also provides an opening space for a further exchange of you know, tests, critiques, and, and experimentation in the field. Um, Given this openness of authors for other possible forms of democratic liberalism, it is a bit unfortunate to find their relatively strong endorsement of so-called third-way politics, and also of authors, I would say, maybe, it's, maybe that's just my wrong reading, but insufficient attention to failures of the third ways. Uh, what I mean by that is it's, you know, the too close proximity of third way to neoliberal politics, as for example, evidenced by some current studies by you know, Gary Gerstel on the American version, Michael Sandel also the republished democracy in discontents, the new chapter also on, the, on Bill Clinton's version and so on. Um, and uh, so the larger, a little bit uh, more theoretical but friendly critique is that the book could push this argument further by avoiding comparisons only with two other ideal types, neoliberal and socialist variant. The structure of the book, when you read it, usually describes the neoliberal take on certain issues, the socialist take, and then the author's take on the issue. And I think by limiting themselves, I think it's important to, of course, confine the book to certain ideal types to make it coherent and easily readable. But I think by pushing further, it would definitely I think in, uh, enrich the, the range of debates and possibilities that democratic liberals can offer very often in the future. Moving to the practical policy part, um, the, talking about the six flagship major policy proposals uh, as described in the book, here I would say that 
uh, my, again, constructive criticism is that revolve a little bit too much about the standard tax and transfer distributive side of the policy spectrum. Not entirely, because there are very important policy innovations, moving this innovation more to so-called pre-distributive of productive side of the, of the, of the policy spectrum. Uh, which requires uh, making a mo more direct intervention into the baseline rules of market economies to make them more democratic and equitable. But again, my, my point is, so basically, I'm not rejecting, I'm just pushing authors to, to go even further with the line of the argument. And here I'll be very concrete. I'll give you one example of how do I envision this type of argument. So, for example, I find the green jobs guaranteed to sound extremely good in theory. But in practice, I think could be extended far beyond, and I'm quoting because this is the example that you provide in the book, cleaning the trash in waterways. A key example, more ambitious productivist approach could easily contemplate a massive green job, New Deal, creating opportunities for real jobs, not just for cleaning the trash, not only for clean, it would have to be, and it doesn't, it wouldn't have to be socialist or statist. So it could easily remain within the compounds or the, the, the limits of what you describe conceptually of a democratic liberalism and uh, um, with you know stronger regulations, subsidies, other incentives to push for a massive reorientation of carbon dependent car or food industry to, into, into a greener world. Um, and the last point, uh, uh, just the two minor things about the constitutional aspect. So I like the opening of the article, quoting uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes' dissent in Lochner, criticizing, you know, putting the particular economic theory of Herbert Spencer in the Constitution. And then um, after that, immediately going into the direction saying that, but yes, we think it's, you know, because Holmes didn't want to see any economic theory in the Constitution, whereas Ross and, uh, actually this is Ross's article, this is not in the book, Ross says, well, but, you know, maybe, you know, we can put some, you know, economic eye. Before I read the full article, I thought, well, this is where I have a problem, but then with the uh, way that she describes the democratic constitutional dimension just in her slides, uh, I, I think uh, she found uh, sort of a very uh, a valuable uh, sort of uh, uh, response to that problem because think about you know putting too strong economic theory in the constitution you know, how to respond or how to justify the fact that you know maybe tomorrow you know there will be conservatives in power and they will want to have you know completely different theory of constitution so if we are democrats you know we have to accept this fact and we should not push too far into this and the Rose's response I think it's a very good very valuable and consists of uh, different versions of weak protections. Uh, and I'm quoting from her from her article here, allowing the scope for ongoing democratic debate and consultation around their scope and content. So here, implementation of rights depends on legislative constitutional judgment. So, and I here finally uh, Ross's argument brings me to another very interesting uh, attempt to sort of approach this different kind of democratic, liberal, maybe they use different name, even constitutionalism in a similar direction. And that is by uh, Willy Forbat and Fishkin in their anti-oligarchy constitution. So they use very similar argument. They want to see more programmatic uh, uh, provisions in the constitution. And on I cross, they also argue that, uh, for example, the New Deal, uh, provide New Deal was an example of that because New Deal was FDR actually won the 1936 elections by the largest majority, the largest landslide in American history. He had the full control of everything, and yet he decided not to amend the Constitution, not to change the Constitution, but to, um, to go to reinterpretation of the Constitution with a massive program of legislative enactments. So I think I see here the connection, the bridge between uh, two uh, uh, interpretations, and I find that approach very powerful and promising for future uh, thinking about the uh, you know future uh, prog uh, future direction of democratic constitutionalism. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, uh, Boyan. Um, can I now turn to Prerna, please, for comments? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Rehan, for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Um, I had the opportunity to read this book last year in May um, and write a review, uh, a contribution for the Law and Society blog. It was a great learning experience uh, reading this book. 
Um, thank you so much, Roslyn, uh, for this insightful contribution. Um, many of my students from uh, the uh, from the Law, Poverty, and Development course were so eager to read this book, um, and they learned much from it. Uh, so thank you. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is basically two things. So the first I would like to talk about are the highlights from the book, um, ideas that have uh, actually stayed with me. They struck me really hard last year and they've stayed with me. And the second is about some questions that I have raised. I've raised it already in the blog to which uh, Rosalind has responded. Um, but I'll talk about those questions that I have. Uh, and the book also, you know, made me read, uh, made me do a few more readings and I want to get deeper into these questions. So there's one thing that I had not raised in the blog, which I have a question about. Um, so yeah, so the first thing that I want to speak about is that, um, so this book is a new contribution and uh, it, it provides us with a very strong, even convincing arguments about how to think about uh, doing governance right especially post uh, the pandemic, post COVID. Um, how do we think about uh, or rethink liberalism as the model of governance uh, in a post COVID era? So that's the first idea that has struck. The second thing that I want to talk about is how uh, this idea of democratic liberalism is a viable replacement. Is it workable? It, it's attractive for sure, but is, is it workable? Is it feasible, um, especially neoliberal, you know, especially as a, a replacement for neoliberalism, which has re, which has ordered polity, economy, and society for so long. So now to reorder the three, um, it has to be a very, very, um, you know, a sure, a very good, a viable replacement. Is it? So that's the second question. Um, and especially because, you know, countries have learned lessons, very important lessons during COVID. And to say, and democratic liberalism as a, you know, as a new idea says, oh, these are the uh, priority concerns. These are the priority spheres that we should be looking at and these are not. So would countries uh, think on those lines? So that's the second thing that I want to talk about. Is it a good alternative? The third thing that I want to, um, you know, which is an idea that really stuck with me is that the authors have explained, uh, you know, democratic liberalism as a lens that uses fairness as an approach. So um, to do law policy and regulation, uh, correct. Uh, it's, it's talking about justice. It's talking about reasonableness rather than just talk about the free markets, uh, free market mechanism as the only, as this, as this one lens um, to do law and policy. So the, the idea of fairness is what they talk about. Uh, the fourth thing that is important is, and that's the new thing that I want to ask you is, um, some scholars in the past have offered different prisons, have looked at different paradigms to view global governance. Um, Francis Fukuyama has spoken about one world euphoria and harmony paradigm. Edward said talks about two worlds, us and them paradigm. Uh, realist theorists have spoken about international relations. Um, the chaos paradigm also talks about states. There's complete chaos in the world, etc. Samuelton Huntington, I'm reading currently, talks about clash of civilization, uh, civilizations, the civilizational approach. To global governance. My question is, how is the democratic liberalism project similar or different from these five approaches? Um, so that's a question that I have. Is it close? It is, is it similar? Uh, because uh, Boan talks about culture and how that plays a role. Um, so that's my question um, to you. The fifth point that really struck to me was, um, it's not a pure economic analysis. Which is, which is very convincing because most of these books have a pure economic analysis, but this has that fairness approach. So it's not that banal approach to doing law and governance correct. Uh, so that's something which really is very good about the book. The other point that I have, and I teach uh, Newsbomb and SEND and the capability approach to do justice, it talks about 
the enabling concept to do justice. Uh, this is how I feel the democratic liberalism is more realistic, more pragmatic in its approach. Uh, and that connection with the capability approach comes out really well. Um, rather, the point that I've written in the blog is that the authors have recounted lived realities and everyday experiences of people during the pandemic, instead of relying on a more um, you know, quantitative data, cold numbers and hard, um, hard statistics. So that's something which is um, one of the highlights. Um, the other thing is, Yes, the authors have done a very good job when it comes to uh, highlighting the three major problems that governments across the world have faced during the pandemic, especially, you know, it's it's got magnified these problems, the three problems have got magnified. The first is unemployment, second is poverty, and the third is pollution. And um, how during the pandemic these problems have, uh, you know, uh, got exacerbated because of the policies that governments have, namely the three, uh, you know, the globalization, automation, and um, gigification. So that's something that the authors have brought out really well. Not just that, they haven't stopped with that, but they've said how these, how the gag, that's how you say it, how has this gag wreaked havoc in the lives of the already marginalized populations, vulnerable groups like women, disabled poor, uh, farmers, laborers, unemployed youth, elderly, which is a major concern in many countries like India, Japan, China, religious and sexual minorities. So I think that's a, one of the very good contributions that the, the authors have made that the book talks talks about. Mm. The, uh, the other point that I also want to uh, speak about is, and I've written that in the blog, uh, is that the idea of democratic liberalism as an approach has, I find, a very close resemblance uh, to the concepts of um, a welfare state and the third way approach of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, so, so that's the other point that I felt uh, has stayed with me. Um, the other, uh, I think one of the other points that the book makes and does it really well, and I'll use the phrase that the authors have used. They've said that the democratic liberalism is an alternative to neoliberalism, does not conceive of a government as being either interventionist or indifferent, rather they construct an image of an interested government one which is interested in maintaining a fine balance between seemingly contradictory democratic commitments of dignity and equality as well as freedom um, and autonomy. Uh, so this is some, this is a phrase that has stayed with me. I think um, I really enjoyed the analysis on this part. Uh, the other point that I um, felt uh, I will, I'd like to speak about is they've, they've handled a very difficult topic in term, but they've addressed that topic in terms of ideology, structure, and style. Um, they've, they've said that the newer approach, the de democratic liberalism approach, how is it different from neoliberalism? Is based on ideology, structure, and style. It's more fair, it's more compassionate, and it's more, it's a dignitarian model. And this is something very similar to what the South African constitutional jurisprudence is speaking about in terms of socioeconomic rights, the dignitarian model. Um, so th that's something which uh, I found uh, was very interesting, um, which is why I have recommended this book for people who are interested in public policy, regulatory governance, you know, political science students, students interested in international affairs, law, poverty, and development, people who are interested in questions of law and justice in a globalizing world. I think all of them should read this book. Um, um, also people, and I think the, the sentence from the book I've marked is people are interested or want to broaden their understanding of the capacity of a crisis to catalyze broader social, economic, and political changes in the world. Uh, so this is very convincing as a statement. Um, and you know, the, the other point, and with that, I would go on to the next part of the discussion, is that, uh, you know, especially to convince governments to adopt a governance model, 
uh, to, to move away from neoliberalism or to rethink neoliberalism is, is a very difficult uh, you know, step. It's difficult to convince governments because this is not an easy choice, especially because most governments would think that it's coming from the Western world. It's good for Western countries that constitute, let's say, 15% of the population of the world. How convincing is this argument? Um, so I think uh, that's where I would like to, um, and uh, the book does give convincing arguments. So uh, coming to the second part of uh, the discussion and the questions typically, I'll keep it very short because I've raised it in the blog. I've shared um, also in the comment section, I've shared the URL. So those of you all who are interested can read it. That, that has greater details. But some of the questions that I had were the first one being, some ethical and moral concerns that are that I raised is um, when you're talking about the democratic liberalism project and approach, it talks about how good is government intervention. So when you're deciding on how much should the government intervene or how much should the government stay back from that intervention or restrict um, intervention in citizens' lives, the question is, from the ethics point to ethical point of view is moral concerns, especially morally speaking, if you want to help citizens, you want them to bounce back, you want to provide them with a cushion post a pandemic, is it good to say the government should not intervene? Or is it right to say government should intervene only when it comes to strengthening the free market mechanism and not in other spheres? So that's the first question that I have is from an ethical and moral point of view. The second thing um, is about um, the democratic liberalism approach says UBI, universal basic income, it might not be, is not a very, very good option uh, when it comes to deciding government expenditure to fund such a scheme, especially in India when we have pilot studies, when we have the economic and political survey in 2018, when the government says, oh, we are thinking of eliminating the 950 plus social schemes and rather replacing those thousand schemes with one UBI kind of a scheme, then why does the democratic liberalism approach, why have the authors argued against it? Uh, so that's the second point uh, on UBI. The third point and the third question that I have is um, democratic liberalism project is talking about green concerns. It's talking about green jobs. It's talking about non-human species, um, Anthropocene age, internalizing externalities, green politics. However, realistically, these concerns are really low priority concerns for many governments, even in India. Most political manifestos don't have these concerns at all. Uh, so, I mean, um, then how does even in, you know, developed nations, we've seen Yellow West's protests, the fuel prices rising. But when um, the president in France talks about, uh, oh, let's have a green tax, but that's a fuel tax. People spoke against it, protested against it. The government had to withdraw. Uh, so, I mean, even for developed nations, for developing nations, for least developed countries, uh, green concerns are, real not, are really not priority concerns. Uh, they are more concerned about meeting everyday, um, you know, uh, challenges of food, shelter, clothing, etc. So that's the other thing. That's the third point. The fourth point that I went, uh, the fourth question that I have is about. Um, and that's a question, that's a, that's a fact, that's a factual concern. So for example, the New Zealand government came up with a draft plan 2025, which uh, taxes farmers. Uh, so when you're talking about taxing, when you're talking about these new initiatives, who, which group are you planning to tax? Um, how does the democratic liberalism as an approach talk about uh, taxing farmers? Uh, who pay tax, who are supposed to pay taxes on livestock emissions arising from animal belching and flatulence. Most farmers, the farmers lobby in Australia says, no, we don't want to pay taxes because that's unequitable. It's not 
we, why should we pay taxes? The, the farmers are already suffering from huge debts. So now you're taxing us. Uh, you're taxing the more vulnerable communities. So how does the democratic liberalism project reconcile this concern? The fifth point is about uh, individual rights that the democratic liberalism project heralds as a goal. Uh, considering during the pandemic and post pandemic, there is a reverse trend that we are observing. The three examples that I've written about, the first one is United Kingdom came up with the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act 2022. Um, that is really like gagging people from speaking out against government policies, etc. Um, so that's one example. The other example is from India, where the government passed significant legislations like the farm and the labor courts through a voice vote, not taking into account uh, democratic voices that were speaking against these two legislations. Ultimately, the government had to withdraw not because of a democratic process, but when people came out on the streets and protested um, the Delhi Chalo uh, protests um, that gained, uh, that that was captured by media globally. That's the second example. The third example is from China. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if you could wrap up the next yeah, minute sure. or two. Uh, just uh, two you. more minutes. Um, yeah. the, uh, the other example is from China and New Zealand. There were greater restrictions imposed on individual uh, liberty in terms of complete lockdown. So that's the other example. The, th uh, the, the next, uh, the second last example would be of, and that's a question, how do, how do the authors how does this a democratic liberalism approach guarantee a public baseline option for healthcare services? How does this approach address the three A's, availability, accessibility, and adequacy concerns when it comes to life-saving drugs like antiretroviral therapy for the AIDS, or to um, cure AIDS, um, and remdesivir? Uh, a drug for curing COVID. So that's the second last question. The last one, uh, the last question is about how does the neoliberalism project um, conceive the role played by mega corporates, El Elon Musk um, and the Adanis, the Ambanis in India? Um, how does democratic liberalism regulate the ownership and control of the democratic space by a few rich men or media controlled by um, rich uh, the rich in uh, different countries? Does it provide enough safeguards and guarantees against dissemination of one-sided false propaganda, which are like threats to freedom of speech and expression? These were the points um, that I had. Thank you very much for the deep insights that I got from the book, treatment of such important questions. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let me now turn to uh, Ron Herschel. All right, thank you. So I hope you can hear me well. We are having some terrible weather here in, in Austin. Um, so uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, there's not much left to say uh, after you know two such extensive and brilliant comments by uh, Boyan and Prerna, but I will try my best to add a little bit to what they just said. Uh, so obviously, this is one of the most interesting and thought-provoking books I've read in a while. It's precisely the kind of you know creative, big, deep thinking work that that I think we need more of. Yeah, you know, it is critical, independent piece of scholarship. Uh, it, by independent, I mean it's not camp-following piece of scholarship. And Boyan um, implied that in his comments. It prioritizes political economy, which I think is a is a great move, uh, you know, long overdue move. Uh, it really is rare to come by such a daring address of one of the major challenges of our time, you know, coupled with a, a set of concrete suggestions for how that challenge may be addressed and how are we to fund those measures. I mean, that, that's another issue that I'll address later. And it is also an exemplary illustration of collaborative interdisciplinary thinking and what it can produce because you know Richard is, a, is an economist and Ross is a, is a political thinker and uh, a constitutional thinker and, and together uh, they create a book that is larger than the sum of its parts. So that's, that's terrific. And 
Of course, they offer, as you all know by now, a new vision of fair markets and a fair markets approach and some concrete policies that could make this ideal a reality and the common, we don't have the time to go into details, just buy the book quickly and read it if you have not already. The common theme of all the policies they propose is that they combine a commitment to markets with democratic commitments to equal dignity for all citizens and the regulation of markets in line with majority interests and understandings. And, you know, it's an idea that markets should be both free and fair and well-functioning as opposed to simply free and largely unregulated. And because of this, they're also proposing policies that are blue and pink and green and all this, those neat um, um, terminology, the neat, neat terminology that they use. The book is also explains in chapter eight, which I think is a very important one, how to pay for these ideas and the kind of democratic politics needed to make them a reality. So honestly, I didn't want the book to end. It raises so many captivating and intriguing ideas and, and lines of thought that I just wanted more. And I'm glad that, um, that uh, this may only be the beginning of a new line of thought by uh, Roth and Richard. So with that, I wanna raise a few points. And again, uh, apologies in advance that uh, some of this will simply echo what has been said already but I can't uh, on the go uh, make revisions to what I prepared. So a number of, 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 of more critical thoughts. One is, uh, you know, free markets and democratic liberalism are the book's uh, two main pillars. And I can certainly grasp the prospect of democratic liberalism in the creative, innovative way that Ross and Richard described. But I'm less sure about the concept of fair markets. There seems to be a bit of an oxymoronic um, air to that concept, at least to me, for how and when un or under underregulated markets can be fair in the deep sense of the term. So fair markets depend on government regulation, uh, you know, redirecting uh, resources, reshaping patterns of mass consumption, and so on, which in turn require a major change in macroeconomic approach and the ideational platform upon which it rests. So in that respect, I could easily see how different is the model that Ross and improved the model that Ross and Richard proposed um, compared, say, with Giddens uh, third way that was popular in the 90s. However, it was not immediately clear to me how different is democratic liberalism from, say, the Scandinavian model of social democracy you know, humane capitalism applied on a global scale. So I think, I think, and here I'm echoing what Bojan uh, said earlier, that perhaps there are, a, you know, it's, it's, it's not a dichotomy and maybe there are some nuances on the continuum that may uh, reflect some of the ideas that Roz and Richard have in mind for their fair markets model. The second point, I wasn't entirely clear what COVID-19 got to do with, uh, with it all. I mean, if anything, the pandemic, of course, it's exacerbated some of the trains, but, but I think the book speaks about trains and problems and challenges that are much deeper than the pandemic that started much before, and I, I'm afraid are going to last long after the pandemic is gone. And, and if anything, the pandemic caught us completely unprepared, you know, with excessive reputational premium put on tech in innovation, but without much attention to truly menacing, perhaps even near dystopian trends, climate change, urbanization that I've written about elsewhere. And, you know, and yes, health, pan health pandemics. So for me, the pandemic raised serious doubts how well prepared is a world where things such Twitter and Instagram and TikTok are considered tech with the general media vibe and often shallow tech zeitgeist that come with it to address true genuine global challenges beyond the shared app for short, oh so funny skits, but you know, cool youngsters. So, so, so I thought that some perhaps more attention should be uh, put to the cultural perhaps uh, zeitgeist that uh, adores and admires and cherishes certain things and less so others. Third, 
And this is, a, again, a point that both Boyan and uh, Perna raised before. What is the place of constitutional law in all of this? And Ross, obviously, in her presentation. So with the triumph of rights-based liberal constitutionalism, and in most instances, greater focus on negative, small state rights, individual freedoms, and so on, it is not immediately clear how a fair markets model may be supported within the current framework of mainstream constitutional rights discourse with its emphasis on, on rights and in particular individual rights and limits on government action and so on. And I think that, of course, we all know the critique, you know, from right and left, the, the blend and critique and from, from the right and the Jeremy Waldron critique, you know, from the left, back, going back to the 80s about how the current uh, rights discourse impedes compromise and is, you know, anti-state in an excessive way, anti-compromise, the myth of rights by Stuart Shingle, and all that literature, uh, never mind the whole of hope uh, literature and, you know, its most recent, uh, uh, more nuanced, empirically supported version by uh, Mila and Adam, by Mila Rasig and Adam Chilton. So, so along the same, the same line of thought, it was not immediately clear to me what the author's concrete game plan, so to speak, is with respect to the pervasive identity politics that has become so dominant in certain circles. And, and more to our point here, may impede upon, if not altogether reject, any serious attempt to overcome the serious collective action barriers to achieve fair markets models. So you, we can talk about, I guess, to be, uh, more direct with this point, we can talk as much as we want about the significance of political economy, but it seems to me that the current trend is going in the direction of excessive identity politics that in a way impedes upon the, the, the major premise uh, of this book that we need more political economy and to inject more political economy into the discussion. Um, let me propose or put on the on the table for the sake of discussion a couple of additional thoughts here. With respect to the political process, again, Ross and Richard talk about serious electoral reforms, such as, you know, campaign finance regulations that guarantee, let's say, one person, one vote uh, supremacy over a one dollar, one vote, let's call it ideal. They talk about electoral redistricting processes that, you know, limit um, the potential capacity and how to limit the potential capacity of gerrymandering and about the measure, about measures to encourage widespread voter participation rather than, you know, voter disenfranchisement that is quite common in the US. So my point is that all of this is, 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 is all good, but the undertone and subtext of that particular discussion, I thought in the book, was, was quite geared to an American audience, or at least it's influenced by the chronic malaise of the American political and electoral process. And most countries, most at least stable democracies, um, do not suffer from some of these chronic problems, at least not gerrymandering and the, you know not excessive involvement of big business in the political process in the way it has been going on almost undisturbedly in, um, uh, in America. I also thought that perhaps some greater attention may be paid here to the role of new information technology. And this is something that Perna touched upon towards the end of her comments. You know, the information technology in the political process in particular limiting deliberate dissemination of uh, misinformation and falsehoods that is obviously helping big business to uh, fight all sorts of uh, what it regards as unwanted measures. But back to the Nordic model that I raised earlier, when it comes to judicial review and, you know, it's real counter now, so, so that, you know, the Nordic or Scandinavian model poses a real counter narrative to the American notion of high voltage constitutionalism, hyperactive litigation, judicial review, all that. It, you know, the Nordic countries are stable, prosperous democracies adhere to relatively humane uh, version of, of market economy. I don't know if this would qualify as fair markets, but it's certainly more fair than uh, the American understanding of uh, almost unregulated uh, markets. 
It has, you know, guaranteed political freedoms, relatively low Gini index, high taxes, viable collective meta narratives, all achieved with, you know, little judicial review, extensive or hyperbolic rights discourse and so on. So again, it seems to me that the Nordic model uh, in its entirety is not very different than what Ross and Richard have in mind for a combination of democratic liberalism coupled with fair markets. Um, Richard and Ross also talk about a universal jobs guarantee and other measures that seem to require or at least call for some kind of supranational regulatory regime. And here I think perhaps we need to think further about this. Uh, is a global legal order. I mean, so so I'm, I'm, I'm quite skeptical of the ability of a nation-based constitutional order, if you will, a Westphalian constitutional order to address some of these issues. So is a global legal order to replace, you know, is it to replace the current state-based legal uh, and constitutional order? Is that what we want? And if so, how are we to overcome one of the main reasons for the current backlash against liberal constitutionalism and perhaps you know, the, the, the prevalence of an us be them uh, sentiments uh, targeted against, largely against you know, supranational tribunals, transnational entities, norms, et cetera, that tend to subvert the local and to impose their supposedly cosmopolitan universal ideational preferences from afar geographically and metaphysically. So, so my point here is some of the measures that Richard and Rose um, call for must require some global coordination. And, and, and I was left kind of um, hanging in the air in not entirely clear uh, whether this is what they advocate for, whether this is favorable, whether this is necessary. Uh, one more thing perhaps, how to fund it all. So this is a very important chapter. This is, I believe, chapter eight. I could be wrong, but I think it's chapter eight. It explores the implications of fair market ideas for the budget bottom line of uh, governments. And you know, it argues that democratic liberalism requires reconsidering neoliberal commitments to fiscal austerity and a greater emphasis on long-term fiscal investment by governments, including cases where it leads to budget deficits and increased government debt. Providing it as you know, uh, it is a good debt, not a bad debt, and, and, and so on. Uh, and you know, it supports capital, not purely current expenditure. It further suggests that the debt and deficit uh, burden associated with the fair market approach could be alleviated by a range of new sources of tax revenue, including through closing existing loopholes and new forms of capital and progressive value added taxes although not large scale increases in wealth income or corporate taxes. So here, I think this is the place where I think uh, it's, it's perhaps to me, the soft, the, the soft spot of the book. So, so the book, the buildup to chapter eight is big. And I felt that to some extent, maybe this is purposeful, uh, to some extent, the set of proposals in um, the last chapter struck me as somewhat underwhelming given the scope of ambitious proposals that Richard and Ross put on the table in the previous seven chapters. So, you know, they they don't talk about the birthright lottery element, you know, where we are born and how, you know, and how utterly significant it is to our capabilities beyond the Nussbaum Amartya Sen thing. Uh, you know, basically where we are born effectively predetermines many things. They touch upon, but not elaborate on inheritance and, and inheritance tax and, and, and this entire business of intergenerational transfer of wealth. But I don't think they go deeply into it. And to me, this is a major issue that stands at the core of this almost unrestricted accumulation of wealth. And they don't mention or mention just in passing ideas such as uh, putting caps on accumulation of wealth, you know, serious limitations again on the currently near unrestricted intergenerational transfer of wealth. Um, perhaps ideas concerning mandatory, as in not voluntary, philanthropy, 
radical measures that warrant the uber rich to reinvest in enhancing the quality and scope of uh, provisions of public good and so on. So I thought chapter eight requires some, to me, it felt like I, I wanted to hear more beyond tweaking the, the tax system and imposing more taxes. So in summary, uh, in the name of allowing for more discussion, I, I have like, I don't know, four more points, but I'll, I'll let me stop here. In summary, one of the most, this is one of the most original thought-provoking books published in 2022 and honestly in, in, in more than that, in years. It is a model for the type of big, deep thinking that leading academics in our field should produce more of. And I really want to commend um, Richard and Ross for producing such a wonderful piece of work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Aran. So Roz, you've got a lot of questions there um, and points. Would you like to take a few minutes and uh, maybe respond to some of them? Yes, please. Thank you so much, all three of you, for such generous and kind, but also probing comments and questions. <clears throat> I'm not going to try and um, respond seriatim, but I've grouped my responses into six points. The first is about the audience for the book. The second is the continuum point. The third is the green dimension. Uh, four is taxes. Five is uh, constitutionalism and six is cosmopolitanism. So on the audience of the book, this was actually a very, very hard book to write because one's trying to think about who might read it, it might actually listen. And, and as I started at the beginning, you know, there are not a lot of us on the call. It's a small political economy field. I wanted it to be a book that policymakers, you know, people in legislative offices could read and, and understand but not turn off a more general audience that aren't kind of policy wonks in a particular area. So it was very hard to write, and I don't think we got it perfect, but we were constantly grappling with who are we speaking to here? How much, you know, do we have to satisfy, you know, Amari Sen or Martha Nussbaum versus, you know, someone in Biden's, you know, East Wing kind of third secretary kind of level? And I think that there's a studied ambiguity in some of the places in the book around that. And I agree with you, Ran, and we, again, thought about this hard, that the word fair doesn't quite satisfy a theorist in how we understand and define it. But my own view is if these ideas are ever to get any traction, you have to imagine a politician being able to endorse them in the way that Blair endorsed, you know, Giddens and the third way. They've got to come up with a phrase that is in some way um, legible to ordinary voters. And democratic liberalism just isn't, right? It's legible to us as people who are interested in and somewhat versed in political theory, but you need a catchphrase for people that captures some of the core ideas. And I really love, Prana, how you express the kind of compassion, justice, fairness dimension to them, but in ways, Ran, I completely agree are unsatisfactory theoretically. Um, on the other hand, Bojan, the kind of stuff around the jobs guarantee, there isn't enough detail in this proposal for it to be ready to be implemented. Part of that is my commitment as a comparativist to the understanding that detail is always contextual and has to be worked out democratically and contextually. But part of it's pragmatic, which is the kind of editorial dimension of like, if you have like a laundry list of specifics, people are like, whoa, this book is way too technical for me. And my brain is always interested in the laundry list. And so I, I love to talk about that aspect of institutional and policy design, but a, a kind of considered judgment was around how far to go down that rabbit hole in some of these core areas. But if anyone ever gets interested in the ideas, then the job is to full out, you know, flesh it out as a real working paper for a particular country at a particular time that fleshes this out much more and puts some of those more ambitious ideas that you've mentioned um, on the table. I've really enjoyed one of the things about living in Australia, other than the beaches, <clears throat> modulo the sharks, is that, you know, Lizzie Perriman and I um, have co-directed the Pathways to Politics for Women program. I do um, play a role in some forms of public debate. I, I appear before and try and lobby members of the parliament. Part of what I'm always interested in when we think about these ideas is how do we get politicians and the people putting pressure on them to pay attention? And that is 
a mix of big ideas with then a willingness to fill in the detail if and when the right political moment arises. So Richard and I have done like a, a dozen or half a dozen at least public policy reports about childcare, about superannuation savings, about aspects of climate policy in Australia that very much put the meat on the bones. But as comparativists, we know that those decisions have to be deeply contextual and politically informed. So the second thing about the continuum is if you go and look at the, the detail of the article in the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, you will see that many of the Nordic countries fare you know, pretty well in terms of my saying that they fit with a fair market model. And you know, Mark Tushnet has made this point to me. He's like, you're just market-based socialists. It's no different. And I think I embrace that in sort of 80% terms, subject to two things. One is to the extent that this is a theoretical and a political intervention that believes in the possibility of actual change, I'm trying to actually make a point that's different from market-based socialism because that is not a brand that wins the centre of politics in many countries. It does in the Scandinavian political context, but not in many other countries where these ideas have to compete. And so it's simply a kind of pragmatic nomenclature choice, which is of no substantive significance, but rather of political rhetorical significance. But the substantive significance, I think, also is there in many contexts and really matters. The first instincts of democratic socialists, even those who, you know, grudgingly accept the role of markets, is that if something is important, it should be provided by the state and it should ideally be provided universally. And the instinct of the democratic liberal is we should only pay for it universally for a very good reason. And most of the time we should only pay for it for those people who really need it. So it should be means tested, not uh, general, unless the political economy requires it to be general. And secondly, there are plenty of cases where it's better to give people a subsidy and impose a mandate and oversight and regulation than it is to provide directly. And that is because either of efficiencies from the private sector or the sheer administrative and regulatory complexity of a single payer state provided model. Now, we cite the work of you know, economists and others who say there are lots of cases where you want the state to provide prisons, detention centres, you know, schools, but there are reasons for that that go beyond the particularities, you know, that they are market specific. And the basic problem with using the valence of democratic socialism with a market dimension is our instinct is always single provision. I don't have a problem with single provision. I'd happily live in the Nordic countries as long as they, you know, imported some sunshine from time to time. But it is politically infeasible in real world conditions in a whole range of settings. The Democratic Party candidates who ran against Biden had no ability to pay, and I'm going to get to Rand's ability to pay, for any of the big ticket Medicare promises, even before they added free college tuition and the like, which is... The, the vision of a UBI, free education and free healthcare in a, an open economy that has immigration. And one of the biggest problems for us holding up the Nordic countries as models is they are not pro-immigration societies. They're very closed societies. One of the biggest problems is you cannot pay. And, you know, one of the things that Richard and I do is we just do back of the envelope costings for universal healthcare in the United States and a you know universal UBI, and it would bankrupt the US Treasury under any conceivable measure, even with some of the tax innovations that you suggest, Ron. And so there's a pragmatism to you know subsidize, you know, require and regulate in conditions of such deeply flawed democratic political economy situations where moving towards you know, the ideal is going to take huge change. And we mentioned in the outset that there is an element of the Australian model that animates this book and this idea. And the Australian model is a public baseline of which there is, a, you know, a top up through a mix of subsidies and mandates. And the baseline is very much universal, but that your ability to access beyond the baseline is more complicated based on income. And I think that that is a more sustainable mix in many countries. And so this is kind of market-based socialism, but with a very pragmatic eye, 
with a view to what about countries that have a lot of immigration, a low state capacity, and or would be bankrupted by achieving anything close to the Nordic model. On the green point, Prenna, I think it's really important. And of course, it has, you know, variable resonance you know, you want to talk about young people, it has the greatest resonance with young people, Ran, but it, it is going to resonate more or less across different countries. But one of the things I want to be absolutely clear about is that we say in the book that if you want to tackle, you know, the green challenge, you cannot do it in a way that is insensitive to economic distribution. And that one of the reasons that, you know, carbon tax type, you know, fuel tax, all of them don't work is they are deeply regressive. And so one of the things we say in the book, and this does pick up on a very specific policy report that Rich and I have spent so many hours writing and trying to push, and again, no one wants to do it because all they want to do is virtue signal and say we're in favour of climate targets and we'll be out of politics by the time they haven't been met. And I literally go up to elected officials in Australia at coffee shops and hound their spouses to give me meetings with the minister is to say you need a mechanism Otherwise, it won't work. And the mechanism is that taxes of that kind have to be redistributed to citizens. You cannot tax and not redistribute to citizens if you are going to use Peguvian taxes as a tool for addressing green challenges. And if there were um, more willingness to consider that kind of model, which we call the dividend model, it would alleviate a significant portion, a significant portion of the inequality challenge Although, of course, you have to worry about the cosmopolitan aspect. Okay, on taxes run, I think it's really important to focus on taxes and their different purposes. One purpose is Peguvian taxes to internalise externalities, in which case we should not be seeking to raise revenue for the state. We should be seeking to deter pollution or anti-social you know, conduct and then make sure that the poor are not disadvantaged by redistributing it to them. We also want to raise revenue, and part of what we try and come up with are pragmatic taxes that could raise quite a lot of additional revenue in a real-world cosmopolitan setting. People who tell you that they want to raise corporate taxes in their country, unless that country is one of the G5, forget it. Capital just leaves the setting, you know. And so the left tends to have this utopian discourse around tax, which is like, uh, yeah, it'd be great, but none of the money will stay in the jurisdiction to be taxed. So instead of collecting 25%, you'll collect zero. Um, and my, I mean, Richard is further conservative than I am on tax, but most of my pragmatism is there is no point trying to raise revenue from sources that will generate zero revenue. And death tax or intergenerational taxes generally are easily avoided by the super wealthy getting good estate planning advice. And therefore, all of the, you know, democratic socialists left in the United States that touts death taxes and estate taxes as solutions has not read the data because it does not raise revenue. Now, the third purpose of tax is to literally destroy wealth to prevent it generating intergenerational sources of inequality. And we specifically say in the book, it is possible that you might want to tax wealth intergenerationally, not so as to raise revenue, but so as to promote fairness, but you'd have to be smarter about it than just getting people to spend thousands of dollars on accountants to do effective tax planning, right? that it might actually be that you need to destroy wealth in order to have fair political markets and fair intergenerational systems. But this goes back to my first point, which is I'm still young-ish and I haven't yet got, got given, given up on the possibility of persuading anyone of any of these ideas. And it would be politically toxic to associate fair market and democratic liberal ideas with some of those more radical tax solutions. One of the solutions that we do not explore that I am personally, Richard's ambivalent, strongly committed to, is the revitalization of efforts at a global Tobin tax, a kind of global financial tax that could be redistributed for co uh, cosmopolitan ends, and that's quite radical. And that the progressive VAT is much more radical than you credit it because it would harness you know, new payment systems, a cashless kind of base and large exemptions for, you know, lower income spending. And so it's quite significant change. 
But the animating principle is will it actually raise revenue and not be regressive and will it not lead to people, you know, shifting their behaviours to subvert the tax? But, you know, maybe in 20 years I'll write the book that's like actually stuff it. Now this is how we really get the money, but not yet. On the cosmopolitan dimension, <clears throat> I think it's really important future work and it may be done by people who are more politically, um, theoretically minded than us. All I would say is the following. It's closer to Huntington Prenner than anyone else in your list because it's saying there is a fight. There's a fight between Putin and Xi and Trump and the other alternative and this is what we want the other alternative to be, right? And so it's trying to offer a, a conception of liberalism that's morally and politically attractive that can fight it out against these forces that are clearly gaining traction around the world as rival ideolo ideological conceptions of the role of the state. Um, but that does not mean on the cosmopolitan side that Ryan is wrong, Ryan is never wrong. Of course there's an element of the duty to aid and the idea that there is a redistribution across countries as well as within implicit in this theory. Again, for reasons of complexity, space, audience, and political pragmatics, that's another's tale for another day. Finally, on the constitution, you know, this is for the younger scholars. If anyone um, ever bothers to watch this who's um, not joining us, I know that we've got some of the early career scholars joining. You know, it's interesting. The more I do work, the more I realise that all my work is ultimately connected, even though I thought it wasn't. And that the ideas around responsive constitutionalism, Rehan, that you know it actually do dovetail somewhat. My vision is one that is legislatively dominated, but in some way fourth branch and court infused. You know, to Rand's question, structure matters more than rights, but rights still matter. We cannot, you know, buy into the idea that there's a dichotomy between protecting rights and identity and structural change. We just have to rebalance our left-leaning progressive politics towards structure and political economy. But I think buying into the idea that we're in a fight with identitarianism and wokeism is a mistake that the right is encouraging us to buy into and I don't agree with. But structure has to get more focus and political economy has to get more focus and that this is ultimately a vision that could be operationalized well through responsive constitutionalism. And I didn't know that when I started on the project, but as you say, Bojan, it's a lot of legislation with a little bit of constitutional nudges around the edges. And that's kind of in line with my broader theory of uh, institutions and judicial review. Um, we really have almost no time, but maybe one or two closing remarks from the yeah. audience and over to you, Rehan. Yeah, I was going to say exactly the same. If there's one or two folks in the audience who want to ask a question or raise a comment, um, please feel free to do so. Anyone? Okay, I actually have a couple of questions, but given that we're basically out of time, I can email you separately, I think, Roz. Um, so thank you all very, very much. This was such a rich discussion. Congratulations on the book. I echo what everybody said. I found it really insightful and different from most things I read um, on constitutional law. And it, it really, I think, does reorient the field in a really exciting new way. So um, thank you all again. This will be up on YouTube. So hopefully the viewership will expand over time as well. And yeah, have a have a good rest of the day and a good weekend, everybody. And thanks so much for organizing into the team for all its work at Icon S. Uh, it's wonderful, you know, for Ran and me in particular, but for all of us to be part of this ongoing global conversation that makes the society so vibrant. So thank you, Rayhan, and your team so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Raz. Bye, everybody. Bye.